Hey, welcome everybody. Coffee with Cluffy. We got a great uh, lineup of speakers and a good topic here today. We've got two of uh, Grand Fawcett's finest. Been with the company a long time, very knowledgeable. We've got Adam and Reese with us today. They are going to tag team a little bit, so um, you know you'll hear from both of them as we go through this. So a uh, lot to cover. We're going to go through a couple uh, housekeeping slides here quickly, and uh, then we'll we'll turn it over to the boys. So hit me on the next slide, please, Adam. Ready. Thank you for today. Yeah, just a little housekeeping slide here. If you have some issues with the presentation, sometimes it's uh, it's just a matter of a closing out and, and coming back in. You get a different line connection or something like that. So if you've got an issue with the sound or something, it's usually in the connection. Uh, there's a phone number for, uh, you know, go to webinar people if you have a uh, questions you want to ask them. Uh, these will be up on our YouTube channel. It usually takes us a couple days to convert it and get it up there. So if you want to watch it again or share it with your team uh, later on, give us a couple days for it to show up on the Coffee uh, with Cluffy YouTube channel. Uh, about a week we say there. So, okay. <clears throat> Yeah, so what we did, we changed the slide a little bit, maybe since the last time you uh, you joined us. And basically what we did is we put the PDH on there. So we don't have the class certified with any state uh, per se. We've been doing this for what, 12 years now, I guess, pretty close to that. And we haven't had any pushback from people saying they've taken the certificate to their uh, jurisdiction and they uh, didn't accept it. So um, that part's up to you, you know, run it by your uh, engineering board or your, if you're a plumber and you have to get your, your credits for your plumbing license, um, take it to them. What we're finding is a lot of the um, places that uh, need certification are getting a little bit more lenient on uh, what they require. Sometimes it had to be in person, but with these COVID times, I know the state of Iowa just sent me a letter and said, you know, we're going to accept more webinar training as opposed to live in-person training. So uh, find out what you need on your end and uh, let us know how we can help you with that. And that'll show up as an electronic uh, certificate. Um, so that's next, November. Cody and I are going to tag team on one talking about the cleaning, fill, and purge system, the critical component of it. So uh, there's the turkey. That's us, I guess. <laughs> Thanks. You don't often see me in a tie like that. It's got to be an old picture. <laughs> so there's our team for today. And I think this is probably last housekeeping. I'm going to uh, let them jump right into it. Got a lot of knowledge sitting there, uh, right in front of you right now. In fact, you can probably see them on your screen. You might recognize these boys from out in the... Uh, out and about when we were able to do that. So take it away. Thanks, Bob. Um, all righty. So welcome, everyone. Let's see here. Um, thank you for taking the time. I know you're all busy and hopefully you're all staying safe. Um, I'd like to thank Fluffy for this opportunity. I know our companies have a very strong global partnership and it's great to be a part of the, this Coffee with Fluffy session. Um, you know, truth be told, I've got a big old stack of Kalefi Hydronics books on my shelf. Uh, I think those things are pretty much worth their weight in gold. So uh, if okay. you're new to hydronics or anything like that, those are those are pretty good. Um, so anyway, let's get down to business here. Um, today we're here to talk about pressure boosting. So as engineers and designers, you all have several factors to consider. Um, I think your main target should be to specify a booster that will provide efficient, reliable, and trouble-free operation. So my goal is for this presentation to serve as a guide to help get you there. Um, some of the items we'll look at today, you know, why are pressure boosters required? What do we need them to do? And then we'll take a look at various high-rise designs and layouts. Um, then a quick intro to sizing and selecting. And then we'll talk about the most, effect, most efficient method for parallel pump control. Now, it, admittedly, a large focus is going to be on commercial applications, but we'll review some residential stuff towards the end. Okay, so why are pressure boosters required? Well, the world just wouldn't be what it is without Kramer at his full potential. So, um, but seriously, why do we need pressure boosters? So the main reason is, well, sometimes the pressure delivered to the building is just plain old too low. So symptoms you'll see, you get a lot of complaints from the tenants. They don't have any water pressure. Um, that's not good for anybody, right? And then other factors that come into play, um, backflow preventers, water filters, 
um, you know, water meters, you name it, all of these items provide a, an unwanted pressure drop to the building supply pressure. Other things to keep in mind, um, multi-story buildings, every floor represents a sizable drop in pressure, and that's what we call elevation head, and we'll talk about that a little later. So here's just a quick example. Um, 67 PSI coming in from the city mains after we go through the water meter and the backflow preventers. Now we're down to 50 PSI, and that leaves us with 25 PSI at the middle floors and about 10 PSI at the top floor. So um, Kramer's not gonna be happy sitting at the top of the building with only 10 PSI. Um, so what must, what must pressure boosters do? Um, the first thing is they must deliver adequate pressure to the building. So things like flush valves, they've got a minimum operating pressure in order to function properly. And then you've got dishwashers, you know, laundry machines that, you know, big laundry machines at hotels. Um, and then you don't want to forget about cooling towers, you know, without adequate makeup. Um, condenser water temps start rising, and I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure the chillers don't like that. So uh, next we've got, we want the pressure boosters to deliver comfortable pressure to the building. So obviously comfort implies people. So, you know, we don't want too much and we don't want too little. Um, and in today's world, booster systems are pretty much supplying constant pressure um, using a constant pressure control mode to the building through the use of VFDs or variable frequency drives. Um, variable speed pumping, it's probably a class all by itself, so we won't really get into that too much. Um, other tactics to assist you know, with comfort might be um, advanced controllers that can do proportional pressure algorithms. Um, and we can also use diaphragm tanks and bladder tanks, which help smooth out the peaks and valleys. And finally, um, you know, we want the pressure booster to be reliable and efficient. Um, so these are probably what you call passive or behind the scenes traits. Um, the last thing anybody wants is a maintenance hog or an energy hog. Um, and like I said, long life and operation is key. And so one of my one of my favorite phone calls back when I was on the tech support line at Grunfoss was Every every blue moon you get a maintenance guy and he he'd say, you know, I've been working here seven years and I didn't even know this this system was in there. And and that's what you want. You want it, you don't even want them to know it exists. You just want them to know that they have water pressure. Okay, so let's take a look at some of the main components of a pressure boosting system. Um, for time's sake, I'm just gonna call out a few items here. Um, so the pressure sensor. Uh, that would go on the discharge manifold, and that is our control signal for the process variable. And on the suction side, I want to note that, you know, most of the times, like Grunfoss will put a pressure transducer on the suction side. Um, some people do a pressure switch, but at a bare minimum, we need something to monitor for dry run protection because you don't want those pumps to run dry. Um, Next, we've got suction and discharge manifolds, pretty obvious, but when you're dealing with high rise pressure boosters, um, the discharge manifold rating, it, it's gotta be rated for the maximum possible pressure. And what I mean by that is you need to sum up the maximum inlet pressure you know, from the city, and then you need to met, uh, add to that the max shutoff pressure of the pump. So when you look at the pump curve, all the way on the left, the highest, boost possible at zero flow, that's what you need to add to the incoming pressure because a pump might be accidentally running at 100% speed, um, it's gonna be boosting that much pressure. So if you got 100 PSI coming in and then the pumps are designed for 180 PSI, but they can actually do 200 PSI, that's a 300 PSI sitting on the manifold. Um, check valves, you can't forget the check valves. Um, and, and please make sure that you check the orientation of the check valves during commissioning. That's many an hours have been lost troubleshooting only at the end of the day to find out that the check, one of the check valves is backwards. So um, I would definitely add that to your commissioning checklist. Um, pressure gauges, that's pretty, pretty easy stuff, right? Um, but 
please to everyone out there, please make sure that you require in or install for your contractors a pressure gauge on the suction side of any pump or any booster because I can tell you that the first step of troubleshooting is let's check the inlet pressure and the outlet pressure, get our differential pressure and compare that to the shutoff head on the pump curve. Um, if we don't have a pressure gauge on the inlet, we can't do that and you can't really troubleshoot a pump very efficiently. Okay, so here's a booster at a hotel. Just some installation pictures here. Um, pop quiz. Who can tell me the critical component shown on this picture that wasn't on the previous slide? Something that should be on every single installation. Uh, so for those of you who got it, that would be the flex adapters. Every system needs that. Um, they're critical for sure. And these are CRE, CRE 32 pumps, I think, 10 horsepower and about 160 gallons per minute nominal each one. Uh, here's Wash U in the School of Nursing. That's in my backyard. And yes, for those of you who are astute enough, it's missing the flex adapters here. <laughs> I'm not sure who, who I need to yell at for that. Um, okay, so let's talk about some old school pressure boosting systems. Um, up until the 90s, booster system pressure was controlled using pressure regulator valves, also called PRVs for short. Um, here's a multi-pump system. There's a PRV on each pump, and these pumps run at 100% speed, and the PRV is what knocks the pressure down to whatever the, the set point is. So it's a mechanical control of the pressure. Um, so the water comes in the suction line, uh, goes to the pump, gets boosted, more obviously more pressure than what we need. Then it goes to the PRV, knocks it down to the set point, and then back out to the building. Uh, and nowadays, you know, current energy codes are pretty much eliminating the use of PRVs, certainly to control the pressure. Um, and we'll, there's a couple slides on, on that later on. Um, okay, so here's an interesting concept that needs to be understood. I might turn this over to Reese. You want to take it away? Sure, Adam. Um, so uh, I like to talk about these things. It's especially important for retrofit applications. And I call it actual pump head or actual pressure versus apparent pump head or apparent, apparent pressure. So when you're especially replacing existing systems with pressure regulator valves, like the one you saw on the previous slide. So here you got a pump curve with a design head and flow, which we're rarely gonna run at for a booster. And then what we're doing today is we're supplying variable speed systems. So you're gonna have what we call a constant pressure control curve typically, and that represents a straight line. Um, so as you reduce flow, um, you're going to follow that control curve and keep the pressure constant on the discharge supplying to the building. Um, and then, so when you're at low flow, which is going to be frequent on a booster, especially in a residential or commercial uh, building, um, you're going to have pressure coming in from the city. So this example might be uh, 20 PSI coming in to the pump inlet. And then, so if you're looking at a, a at one of these PRV systems, you're going to see 80 psi discharge. You're going to see 20 psi suction. You're going to see what I call the apparent head of, of of a boost of 60 psi. So that's about 140 feet of head. So you're seeing a boost of of 60 psi. And if you were to go select a replacement booster, that's really all you need. Maybe even a little less, but you want to size a replacement based on that same apparent pump head. The mistake I see is what people will do is they'll read the tag information of the existing pumps and the existing pump nameplate will have the head of that pump and that's the head of the pump before it goes through the pressure regulator valve and then out to the discharge manifold. So in this case here, if we were at a low flow, you would see 80 PSI in the discharge gauge. What you do not see a lot of times is the pressure between the pump outlet and the pressure regulator valve. And in this case, it's 100 PSI. So the actual pump head is 80 PSI of boost. 
as opposed to 60 PSI boost. So a big mistake made in retrofit situations is using existing pump tag information to supply a brand new booster. And everybody says, oh, it's variable speed, it'll correct itself, it'll right size itself because it's got VFDs. To the point, yeah, that's true, but why pay an extra $10,000 for equipment when you should actually go with what the building actually needs? And in this case, it would 20 PSI to 80 PSI. So I just want to throw that out there, especially important for retrofit information. So thanks, Adam. I'll give it back to you. Yeah, thanks, Reese. Um, it's a good topic there. Uh, let's see. Let get back to you. All righty. So here's another what I would call old school system. Um, this is a booster with single stage close coupled and suction pumps. And we've got PRVs on each pump again. Um, but if you notice, one of the pumps is smaller than the others. Um, there's a lot of terms for that, but I, I've always called it a jockey pump or a low flow pump. Um, and the intent here is that the jockey pump takes over during periods of low demand, and then the larger pumps take over to handle the, the higher peak demands. So with, with VFDs coming into play, these are pretty much obsolete. Uh, I don't know, Reese, when's the last time you, you saw a system using a jockey pump? Well, I, I usually see these in existing installations because that's what they did years ago. Um, you know, if you go with the old way of doing things, they'll have a, a what they call a 20-40-40, a 20% pump and then two 40% pumps. Mm, and yeah. the smaller pump was running to take care of the low loads, but they all still had fixed speed motors and regulator valves. And then the only other time I see it today on modern systems is a jockey pump for a fire system. Right. Just to, if the, there's a small leak in the system, you don't want the big pumps coming on right. to uh, get the pressure pack up. That would be bad. So, OK. Um, all right. So I figured we'd jump into uh diaphragm and bladder tanks for those of you paying attention you probably saw those in the pictures above um and i know this question came up on the registration survey so let's let's dive in here um so what do diaphragm tanks do uh, first off they help smooth out the system pressure you know when you have flush valves and other fast acting devices on the system um, especially when you have fast acting valves located far away from the pressure transmitter um, think cooling tower makeup valves on the roof. Um, let's see. So the tanks also store a small amount of water and that gives the pumps time to ramp up and, and take over the load demand when you see you know quick quick demands. So looking at this example, um, if you look at the dotted line, this is what happens when you don't have a tank. A, a large demand is going to quickly drop the system pressure and the pump controller is going to see this drop and it's going to ramp the pumps up as fast as possible to counteract the quick the quickness of the pressure drop so the problem is that you know since the pressure already dropped too much the pumps are going to ramp up too much they're going to overshoot the set point and you know you could you controls guys out there you could probably say well i could try and fiddle with the pid parameters but in my estimation you it, it's just going to make it worse so um, when you do when you do have a tank that would be the solid blue line and basically under the same scenario the tank is able to absorb some of that demand and that gives the pumps time to ramp up and take over so the the the, the drop and the corresponding overshoot are are, are mitigated um, and then we, uh, we've got another reason to use diaphragm tanks with booster systems I think with the for, um, yeah for low flow low flow shutdown is pr probably the most important reason to use a diaphragm or bladder tank today in modern pressure boosters is if this system will encounter low flow situations um, this allows for a very efficient pump stoppage during these low flow periods um, so it's key to have the diaphragm tank for low flow um, stoppage and that's a that's an energy code requirement today also and we'll probably talk about that later yeah okay and um yeah and some of you had questions on diaphragm tank sizing so so how do you size the tank and that, that's a great question but i'm afraid the answer is somewhat anticlimactic um, really you just follow the manufacturer's recommendations 
Um, so shown here is just a typical diaphragm tank sizes for variable speed boosters. Um, and, you know, this, this is pretty typical of, of several of the large players that you kind of use similar, similar sizings for their systems. And okay. as you can see, they're, they're not very big either. So we see yeah. specifications all the time now for a booster that has, for example, 100 GPM pumps, maybe two or three, um, and they'll specify 200 gallon tank. But really, if you have a pump that does 100 gallons a minute, you only need a tank in the range of maybe 20 to 30 gallons or so, because again, that tank's purpose is to smooth out. You know, what a diaphragm tank does is it makes a constant pressure verbal speed booster more constant better constant pressure um, and then it also allows for that low flow shutdown it's not gonna it's not intended to keep a pump off all night long it's intended to allow the pump to stop from time to time and 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 stop using electricity and then restart when that flow is is reintroduced so that's the important part about tanks and that's why the sizes don't need to be very big you don't worry about starts per hour with a variable speed pump anymore Right. I think I think that was one of the issues is, is a long time ago, sizing the tank was a little more critical when you had speed controlled pumps and you didn't want to overcycle constant speed pumps. Right. Right. So. And, and another another thing to keep in mind, too, is that the pumps used today for boosters, you'll see these pictures that Adam's showing. These are inline multi-stage stainless steel pumps. That That's a whole other topic later, but it, these pumps are very low inertia. And when you have a very low inertia pump as compared to, for example, a single impeller bronze style pump, low inertia means that you get much more starts per hour. So our typical low inertia booster pump that we supply today can actually withstand 200 starts per hour. And that's across the line, not even counting a soft start with a variable speed drive. So just to give you a picture of, of uh, you know, the permissible starts per hour on a modern stainless steel booster pump. Yeah, I did. did. Pretty much doesn't even come into play anymore. Right. Yeah. Okay. So let's jump into some high rise booster designs. Um, let's see, Reese, what is that? 909 Walnut in Kansas City on the left side? I think it is. Yep. Been there. <laughs> yeah. Yep. And uh, yes. the one on the right, that's, uh, that's one Kansas City place. And, um, I know that all too well because I, I was there during an install on New Year's Eve of all days, uh, installing the booster in that building. So um, anyway, single booster systems. This is probably the most common of the high rise layouts. You know, we've got city mains coming in and that's going to feed the first the first zone, zone one, it, it, and it you know bypasses the pumps. The city pressure is enough for adequate pressure on zone one. And then you've got the pump system and that's gonna boost the, the pressure. And so zone two requires PRVs to keep that pressure in check because the pumps have to boost, you know, a sufficiently high pressure to have the desired pressure on zone three. So that's why you need the PRVs at zone two. Um, so Reese, what can you tell us about pressure transducers and diaphragm tank placements? A lot of times this is designer choice. Um, it's, it's very typical to put the sensor on the discharge header of the system and then have your tank there um, and just maintain constant delivery pressure. However, when the buildings get really tall, you're working with a much higher working pressure at the bottom to deliver the water all the way up to the top. So some designers will choose to put the diaphragm tank up there because then it can be exposed to much lower pressure. And then some will actually put the transmitter up there as well um, to maintain pressure at the top level instead of the base level with the pumps. And both will work okay. Sometimes when the sensor is a good distance away from the booster, it takes some tuning at startup, some fine tuning mm -hmm. and things like that. What I recommend is if you are gonna go with a roof mounted sensor or remote mounted sensor, have a diaphragm tank close in proximity to the sensor because that enhances the controllability going back to the control signal there. That's, that's in, some a case, point. in some cases, you'll have tanks at both locations if the pressure at the base is low enough um, because by having both tanks there, it actually makes your constant pressure system even more constant pressure and it also enhances your low flow shutdown. Everybody talks about no flow shutdown, but the best 
booster system design stops at low flow before it gets to zero. And mm -hmm. the only way that's possible is to utilize diaphragm tanks. Any booster system you see out there that doesn't have a diaphragm tank for low flow set down, it requires a zero flow condition for a set period of time for that thing to shut down. Um, I also recommend to you designers out there that if you specify a booster system, make sure the manufacturer has a controller that's capable of going from a roof sensor to a discharge manifold sensor fairly easily without somebody getting on an airplane flying out there with some special software. Make sure the controller has a capability to easily switch from one to the other. That just makes the whole thing simpler because a lot of times the, the location of the remote sensor isn't always optimum as specified by the designer. And then a lot more field work is involved in that. So you want a pump control that is easily adaptable from remote sensing to local sensing. Yeah, and and, and for and the installers and the contractors, um, definitely want the diaphragm tank up as high as possible because um, the ASME code tanks and the high pressure tanks get pretty expensive to put it yes. down down near the booster. That's so that's a critical thing. Yes. Um, okay, so the next one, we've got a two zone system. Uh, again, the city mains comes in, feeds the zone one uh, floors, and then zone two has its own booster. We call that the low zone. And then zone three has its own booster, the high zone. Uh, Reese, you want to talk about the pros and cons? Um, by doing it this way, what you're doing is you're, you're, you can reduce the number of pressure regulator valves you can also get your pump sizes to be smaller. That will actually improve your pumping efficiency a little bit because, uh, you know, if, if nobody's using water in the high zone and then somebody's using water in the low zone, well, your high zone pumps are off. Remember, you put the bladder tank down there, so it's stopping at low flow. And then, uh, so maybe your low zone is the only one that's operating. Um, so you're splitting up the, the water distribution to the building this way. Um, so you can reduce operating costs and uh, you can reduce the number of pressure regulator valves, um, which does offset costs. However, you end up with more risers. So the cost savings with the pressure regulator valves and the added piping may be a wash there. Um, but this is this is done. This has been done with high rise design and it's always a choice out there to, 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 to use it or not. So this is an option that's available. It will almost always result in energy savings, but you have to weigh that with the installation costs. So somebody that's doing the project has to do all, has to crunch all the numbers in the beginnings um, because the pros we mentioned, the cons is that it's a higher price and uh, you know, other things like that. Yeah, and, and you know, on this slide, it's, you know, where do you draw the line? You can have a high mid low zone system because people ask, well, can't I, can I remove all the PRVs altogether? And I mean, sure, of course, but uh, at some point it's just going to become uneconomical and there'll be a diminishing return on initial cost to energy to, you know, PRVs have maintenance, but pumps have maintenance too, right? So, uh, right, right. Yeah. Kind of the same pros and cons there. So, yeah, same as uh, that. And then, you know, yeah. Again, a three three tiered system has three pump sets there, so the the installation yeah. cost gets much more because you got more riser pipes, you got more uh, um, pumps in the mechanical room, and you need all that space and things like that. So uh, yeah, you know, and you just have to pumps, weigh in and assess everything. Right, nine pumps. You know, every some people want to cut down the the number of pieces of equipment, um, so nine pumps can be a little I don't know, overbearing, maybe. Sure. Um, okay, so. An interesting design here, um, the, the single booster with a tank fill. And I think this is used in New York. I'm not sure if they still do it, um, but basically you've got transfer pumps that boost all the way up to the tank on the roof and ignore the symbol. Those are, you wouldn't really need VFDs for those pumps, just size them correctly and they'll fill that tank um, as long as you're running at the best efficiency point. That's what I would target. Um, and then for zone three and zone two, they're gravity fed from the tank that's on the roof. So no PRVs on zone three because the elevation head is, is low enough. But zone two, you're going to need PRVs just because of that, that pressure. Um, you have to knock it down. So reason any, any pros and cons you want to call out on this one? Um, 
Sure. So again, like Adam said, your pumps, they just need to be sized to move the water up to the tank. So they are they don't need drives. They can be fixed speed. You can piss, pick them, select them based on best efficiency, and you can use large pumps so that when they are in tank fill mode, they're running at a, a, a good efficiency point on the curve. The controls are simple, you know, low water, turn the pump on, high water, turn the pump off. So you're just going off a level in, in the tank. And again, this is very, in terms of efficiency, it's actually could be quite efficient because um, your other pump designs where they're at the floor and there's no tank, they're always running, especially in a large building that may not have a lot of low flow shutdowns. Um, so this can be a very efficient mode of operation. The, the other side of it is that the, is system cost is much more expensive because, um, or can be expensive because you have to have the, this large storage tank on the roof that takes structural cost, um, the cost of the tank itself. Um, and then you still do need the PRVs at the bottom, but you're gonna need PRVs anyways in a, a very high rise building. Um, and then now you have this mass, large mass of water. This, so now you might bring in water treatment concerns because you have a lot of stagnant water there. Um, so how does that how does that play into the quality of the water, the cleanliness of the water, bacteria growth, and things like that? So that's a another consideration that you have with uh, with you know a large storage of water like this. Yeah. Hey boys, I'm going to give you the uh, halftime uh, buzzer here too, just to help you time out your slides. Here. Okay. So we're, we're probably going to speed it up then. <laughs> All Great right. Job. This is, this is really good information. The graphs are excellent to explain this for people, so thanks. Yeah, hey, yeah. As, as Kramer would say, giddy up. Yeah, yeah, all right. Okay, so last but not least, the super high-rise design. Um, so when the building gets to be so tall, at some point, it's just impractical to have a ground level pump boost all the way to the top. Um, you know, you, you're, the pressure is so high, you're gonna be in custom non-standard designs for the pumps, and that's just, higher costs and, and longer lead times and and you can't find you know service parts and, and, and all that kind of stuff so this design has a storage tank mid-level in the building and so the city mains comes in the transfer pumps just like in the last uh, example boost and fill that tank and then you've got gravity fed below the tank and then an extra booster system above the tank um, with PRVs as needed. And Reese, who, what is it, the, the Hancock building in Chicago? In the Sears building? They, they use this design, right? Yes, yeah, so the those of you who've been to Chicago, you've seen the skyline, the two tallest buildings there, the uh, what used to be Hancock building, the Willis Tower, I believe it's called now, oh, and then right. the, uh, yeah, um, or Sears Tower, um, which is now the Willis Tower. And then you have the John Hancock building and both those are, I think, 100 plus floors. So the design principle on those is that somewhere in the midway point, they have, a, I think, two floors worth is a storing of the water. So there's a set of transfer pumps at the base of the building that transfer the water to the storage tank. So gravity feeds the lower part of the building. And then there's another set of pumps adjacent to the storage that supplies the upper half of that building. Um, so this is a methodology for super high rise. I think the building in Dubai, the the Burj, I think it's called. It's uh, mm -hmm. I think 1,700 feet tall. It's huge. Oh, um, but it's uh, no, I think it's 2,700. It's like a half a mile. But anyways, mm -hmm. uh, that uses a similar similar concept there. So again, yeah. the pros and cons. You're still faced with the storage and possibility of uh, you know water treatment and uh, uh, those kind of things. Um, but when you're talking super high rise it's all expensive you just gotta gotta deal with it <laughs> of course okay so now we know the basic construction of a booster system let's dig into what we need to select one um does anybody know the main components for selecting pumps any guesses okay good i think everybody got that one flowing head um there's plenty of other aspects involved, but just in the interest of time, we're just gonna we're not gonna dive into the nitty gritty of actually sizing the pumps. That's a that's a full course by itself. Uh, first things first, let's take a quick poll here. Um, from your experience, do the current methods of sizing booster pumps result in? Sorry, I had a little pop up in the webinar thing. So, a an undersized pump, b an oversized pump. 
or see an adequately sized pop. And I think, Bob, how do they, does something just pop up and they just click on that? Bob might be on mute. Oh, here we go, I can see it now. Yeah, you see it coming through there? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, 63% oversized pump. Well, I would I would have to agree with the bulk of you guys for sure. Um, okay. So, yeah, I think it stopped trending. Okay, so 69% said oversized pump. 26% said an adequately sized pump. And 5% said an undersized pump. So you who said undersized, you should stay later and we have some extra credit activities for you guys. <laughs> uh, I'm just kidding. All right, so back to the important stuff. Um, pressure is probably more straightforward, so let's start here. Um, the first is static head, so or you know, also called elevation head. That's the vertical distance that the liquid needs to travel all the way from the pump inlet to the highest point in the building. Um, so in commercial buildings, like we said earlier, about 10 to 12 feet per, per floor, and that's going to start to add up real quickly. Next, we've got the friction head, and that's the loss through all the piping and the fittings um, from the pumps to the furthest fixture. You know, for, for closed loop systems, think boilers and chiller loops. Uh, friction head is the major component of your total dynamic head, but for pressure boosting, it's, it's, it should be minimal, provided that your risers and, and piping is all sized correctly. Next, we got the residual head. So this is the pressure that you want at the highest point. So typically 20 to 40 PSI. And then last but not least, believe it or not, this is probably the one that's most easily forgotten. We've got the inlet pressure. So this is the pressure coming into the building before the pump. And, and a very important note, this is a dynamic value. So you want to take this measurement during a period of high flow demand because um, the pressure can drop at high flows. And if you size it based off 80 PSI when there was no flow, and now you got a high flow in the building and the inlet pressure drops to 40 PSI, you're going to have some problems because uh, those pumps won't be able to keep up. Okay, and, and just for time's sake, we're not going to run through this example, but I'll leave it in the, the slide deck so you guys can reference that uh, in the PDF. Um, okay, so system flow, Reese, do you want to you want to take this one? Sure. So for um, commercial, especially commercial buildings, um, the flow, and it might be a office building, a mixed use building, um, an apartment building, the flow is determined by you know obviously we're going to count the fixtures, right? But what we're not going to do is add up the fixture flow rates. So, you know, oh, this is a shower head. It takes two gallons a minute. This is a, a 25 gallon a minute uh, uh, flush valve. Um, so you're not going to add all those up cumulatively. What you're going to do is you're going to look at studies that, that look at probability and things like that. So you, you are going to add up all the fixtures. But what you're going to do is come up with what they call a fixture unit value. Um, so you're going to add all these up. And then so there's some sources out there um, for this, but you'll you'll end up looking at a table. Um, and again, it takes into account statistics and probability. So a couple sources, um, there's a couple sources for this. So the plumbing engineering handbook. So everybody that's a member of ASPE, American Society of Plumbing Engineers, they're familiar with these books. So if you have a uh, volume two that talks about, um, you know, it's a handbook that has a uh, it's a design handbook that has a fixture unit procedures in there and tables and graphs. And so you'll see a couple of charts like these. And these are where you'll, you'll add up all of your fixtures, you know, your hose bibs, your water closets, your urinals, um, everything that's going to have water leaving it. Um, and then you're going to end up with uh, a number. And then you're going to refer to a chart um, to uh, come up with a, with a flow rate. And that what I like that they added um back one adam yeah so what i like that they added years ago they didn't have what they call a bathroom group so i have a little arrow on the left side that points to a bathroom group that's actually in the international plumbing code um i'm not sure if it's been added to the uniform plumbing code lately it's been a, a while since i looked at the upc but 
before they didn't have it. So you would add up for every bathroom, you'd add up a, a bathtub, a, a water closet and a sink. And those would be separately. That made it even more oversized. So I like that they added the, the bathroom group. So once you add up all these fixture units, then you're going to refer to the chart that's on the next slide or a table. And then this is how you're going to determine your flow. Um, so you might have uh, you know, over a thousand fixture units total, but when you look, refer to your chart and get that, you're going to have um, you know, a flow rate corresponding to, you know, so a thousand fixture units would only be a flow rate of, uh, of 200 gallons per minute, for example. Um, so this is the procedure for determining flow in a, you know, today's boosters. And this, this results in oversizing every time, and you plumbing engineers in the audience there, you know this, because these are outdated. We need more studies on lower flow fixtures that we've developed over the years. And these curves are also known as Hunter's curves because uh, Mr. Hunter developed these many, many years ago. Um, but that's when flows were much higher for fixtures and things like that. So these are in dire need of updating. Um, so when we go to pump sizing, we have to be a little bit more careful about looking at this quote unquote design flow that we got out of the fixture unit charts. Yeah. And uh, same thing here. We, we don't have time to run through the example, but uh, they'll be in the in the PDFs, so you guys can look at them later. Uh, all right. So very important topic here. <clears throat> um, so we've got the max design flow, but now we need to know we need to understand what we call the flow profile. Uh, I'm sure several of you are familiar with boiler and chiller load profiles, um, things like NPLV for chillers. Uh, well, this is pretty much the same thing, just GPM instead of BTUs. So shown here is a typical profile for domestic water supply to let's say a residential community. Um, so you've got the, the first and largest demand spike happens in the morning. People are taking showers, they're cooking breakfast, etc. cetera. Um, then the, the demand drops off and then we get a little spike at lunch. And then finally we have a, a big spike at dinner, you know, for the dinner rush, laundry, bath time for the kids, cooking dinner, so on and so on. Um, so what's very typical of a domestic water supply application is that we spend a, a high amount of time at the low flow hours. So in reality, booster systems are only at an appreciable flow rate for around four to six hours a day, which is the blue boxes. And then that means 18 to 20 hours every day are spent at very low flows, which is the green, green shaded areas. So this, you know, this is what we mean by flow profiles is how much time is spent at what flow rate. Um, and, and so obviously different flow profiles exist for various applications, you know, an, an office building might look a little similar, but you'll have more activity in the middle of the day um, and even less at night. And like uh, an industrial application, like a wash down, it's either gonna be, you know, it probably, probably match with the shifts and, and things of that nature. So, um, Reese, anything to add here? And so also keep in mind that uh, when you're sizing your booster, the if you're using the charts for the plumbing codes, which is required in a lot of states to use those charts, um, you're, remember that design flow you're coming up with is representative of something like the dash line up there, which you're never going to achieve. So when you go to select your pumps, you want to make sure that you're using multiple pumps with the understanding that your actual flow will be less than 20% of this design flow for 70 to 80% of the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so now that we, we have a basic understanding of flow profile, we can put this to use with a quick example. So we've got an arbitrary flow profile. Uh, max design flow is 320 GPM, and we spend about 2.4 2 hours a day at that flow. And then a particular note is the flow rate of 60 GPM, where we spend 10.8 hours a day. Uh, so our max design point, the dotted line is our control curve, you know, our constant pressure control curve. So as the flow drops, pressure stays the same. And then we've got, let's say we, we select a single, a single pump for this duty point. So the top blue line is the pump curve, and then the bottom blue line is the efficiency curve. So at that 320 gallons per minute, we're at about 78% efficiency, which is, is pretty darn good, right? 
Um, so now let's take a look at a triplex system. You know, the first black line is one pump running and then two pumps running and then all three pumps running at the same time. Um, three pumps in parallel. And now here's our efficiency curve for the triplex system. So note that we max out at about 72%. So one might say, hmm, what's better, 78% or 72%? But to answer that question, in reality, we, I want to call your attention to two different spots here. You know, the red represents the area where the single pump is more efficient than the triplex. And then the green is where the triplex is more efficient than the single pump. So you might look at that and, and say, well, it, it, it's not just the area under the curve, it's, it's the time spent at those locations. So which system do you guys think you'd want to go with? And um, I'll, I'll give you a hint, 75% of the time, the flow is less than 200 GPM. And then another hint, uh, at 60 GPM, where we spend almost half the day, the triplex system is 25% more efficient. So that's going to add up and provide a, a significant amount of energy savings. Uh, so at, at the end of the day, it's it's the area the area under the curve, you know, multiplied by the time spent at that point. <clears throat> um, so let's see. And that wasn't that wasn't 25%. That was an efficiency difference of 35 oh, percentage points. Yeah. So yeah, you're, you're at 60 gallons a minute, you're running at a pump efficiency of 69% or 34%. Yeah. So yeah. yeah, I'll take 69 all day, all week, twice on Tuesday. That's right. All right. So no matter how well you select the pumps, um, it, it doesn't mean anything without proper sequencing. So um, there are several methods. The flow-based sequencing um, is pretty much outdated, so we're not really going to discuss it. Speed-based uses predetermined pump speeds. So, example, when when pump run, pump one is running and it gets to above 96% speed, it's stage on pump two. And so there are stage on speeds, and then there are stage off speeds. Um, next, we have demand-based sequencing. So that uses PID, and it, it's basically, is the set point met? So if one pump's running and we drop below our 80 PSI set point, it's going to stage the next pump on. And so generally, this method implements timers to prevent overcycling. But, but that means if a pump turns on, it's going to stay on for whatever that time is, five minutes or 10 minutes, and even though the demand is not even there. So you've got a pump running when you don't need it. So it uses some PID, some PID control, but it's a step in the right direction, but it, it, it's not the best. Um, and finally, we have efficiency-based sequencing. And this takes into account efficiency, obviously, to determine optimal staging of the multiple pumps. So in, in this scenario, the controller is continuously monitoring the applicable data points to you know, calculate pump efficiency at that current operating point. Um, this can be done by measuring suction and discharge pressures and back calculating flow or, um, you know, like, like Grunfloss says, preloaded pump curves in the controller. Or, you know, if you have a flow meter, um, that will even further increase the accuracy. And, and one of the best things about efficiency-based staging is that it automatically accounts for changes in the plumbing system. So if the city pressure was 60 PSI when the booster was first installed, but, you know, two, two years later, now it's hovering around 80 PSI, the efficiency-based system will already account for that. Whereas the other scenarios, um, they can't handle that as well. Okay, so here's a pump curve for the triplex system with three pumps in parallel. These dark shaded lines, so that's one pump running on the top, that's the pump curve. The middle is the efficiency and the bottom is the brake horsepower. And then we got the same thing for two pumps and then the same thing for three pumps. And what we want to do here is basically trace the line at the highest point across the full flow range. So whatever our flow is, let's say 600 GPM, this is the highest point. But if, if we look, um, so like at 350 GPM, you see that two pumps, the, the efficiency starts to drop, but with three pumps, it's higher. So 
what we want to do here is, is kind of chop off those trailing edges and, and a, a pump controller that that knows where the pumps are operating at on the curve, it, it can do this automatically and instantaneously. And so in Grunfoss's online selection program, this would be a triplex selection. And, and the bolded red line, this would be our control curve. Um, and it's proportional. That's why it doesn't go straight across. But basically, the system is, um, so at this head and flow, this is our efficiency. And then at this head and flow, that's our efficiency. So, so the key here is that the, the controller is keeping the efficiency as high as possible. And we're at 75 plus percent pretty much for the whole flow range until we get down to maybe the, the bottom 20% of the flow range. Um, let's see. Reese, I don't know if we have time for this, <laughs> but. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll quickly yeah. go through this one. A guy called me once. He says, hey, I bought this triplex. I was told one pump was a backup, two pumps duty. Why are all three pumps running? And I said, well, answer me a few questions. And then I said, uh, do, do you see KW, your power on your screen? He says, yeah. I says, what is it? He says, 10.8 KW. I says, okay, that's what you're paying for right now. And I said, I'll tell you what, I'll show you how to turn a pump off. So I went to the, showed him how to do the control to, to digitally turn a pump off. And he said, did it switch off? He says, yeah. I says, okay, let it stabilize back to your 30 PSI. Um, you, you had about the same flow now as we were before? He says, yes. I says, what's your power now? And he said, 12 KW. I says, so if you personally had to pay that electric bill, which one would you rather pay for? And yeah. so this is, this is a result of efficiency-based staging is we're splitting the flow between three pumps and we're saving 10% on our power. So this is a real world example. Yeah, and, and over time, I mean, that, that's gonna add up significantly. Uh, okay, and then keep going, Reese. We got the energy codes, ASHRAE 90.1. Yeah, so those of you that are uh, required to follow ASHRAE 90.1 energy standards for, for, for plumbing systems, section 10.4.2, um, it's only got three requirements, um, you know, Use a remote sensor to compensate for the friction loss difference between the pumps and the remote fixture, or use pump software that does that, which most manufacturers today that sell variable speed boosters, they have software that will reduce the pressure with reducing flow. So you either remote mount the sensor or use the software. Um, and then no devices shall be used to knock down the pressure for all the water supplied to the building. So your primary booster system that's applying water to the building should not have any pressure regulator valves on it not to be confused with PRVs that are knocking down pressures on the floors in multi-story buildings. Um, so you, they're just saying no PRVs on the pump station itself that's supplying the water. And the most important one for me here is that no system pumps shall operate when there's no service water flow. In other words, when nobody's using water in this building, stop your pumps. That's the biz biggest energy saving thing you can do with a plumbing system today. And then if you want more on this, go to energycodes.gov and then forward slash adoption. That'll tell you which states um, are in, uh, what code, what version of the code each state is following. Yeah. Thanks, Reese. Um, okay. So residential systems, um, let's switch gears for a moment. So we got many scenarios where you might need a residential booster. Um, the two main ones, so first, Sometimes you just don't have enough pressure and you just want a little more, you know, maybe you've got some of those nice multi-head showers that use a, a significantly higher volume of water, uh, or maybe just a large family, a lot of kids taking a bath at the same time, you know, simultaneous usage. Um, so, so basically a, a residential booster is gonna give the owner more pressure, but it, it's not gonna give you more hot water. That's, that's a different webinar. Uh, and then another one is if you're out in the in the country, there's just no city connection at all. That means you've got a well or a cistern, and something has to provide boost to that water to get it, you know, to the house. Um, and, and and one note is bigger is not always better here. Um, and you still you still need to account for max possible possible pressure. So check your max inlet pressure to the house and and you know, same thing, the pump at shutoff, you, you don't want to be much over, what is it, Reese, 90 PSI? I think that's where toilet things start to leak and, and things like that, so. 
Yeah, so I think it's 80, 80 to 90. Yeah. Uh, so here, here's an example of a modern residential booster system. A lot of the same components as the commercial, just in a more compact solution. So we've got the, the integrated VFD motor combo drive and then a pressure tank, you know, pressure gauge and sensor, um, it, it, everything you need to handle the controls and the, and the pressure boost. Um, so the one on the left, that's more for, for small and regular sized homes. Uh, the middle one might be for larger residential jobs. And then the one on the right would be for light commercial jobs. That's a, a twin design. So you get some redundancy. And, and in that case, the motors talk to each other wirelessly. So um, you get like a duty standby. If one fails, the other one uh, automatically kicks on. Um, let's see. So just some, some extras that we can discuss. Uh, we had a lot of questions on, you know, what happens if the incoming line to my house is too small? And, and I think actually the hometown where I live, um, a lot of people are buying up the old mid-century and, and, and very tiny houses. They tear them down and then they build, uh, I don't know what I would call a, a big mansion. So a huge house. And, you know, back in the 50s, the city, I guess, didn't expect to have to feed water to such a large house. But unfortunately, there's, there's no easy way out here. Um, a, a bigger pump can only do so much. It, it can't pull the same, you know, higher volume of water. Um, so option A, the utility has to come out and increase the line size. Or option B, you could do an atmospheric brake tank. And, and that would provide the necessary volume of water to handle, you know, size it for your morning, noon, and dinner time spikes. Um, but the problem is, you know, it's atmospheric, so you lose all pressure from the city and the pump has to re reboost 100% of, of what, you, what you're looking for. And, and Reese, did you say like down in Houston, that's a requirement, the brake tanks? Yeah, in the Houston Metro for um, for the piping that's coming from the city, they're required to to use brake tanks. So they they don't get the advantage of taking pressurized water from the city. It's a code requirement um, mm -hmm. around the city of Houston. So everybody's got to have a brake tank. Interesting. Yep. Um, okay, NPSH. Um, I see a lot of you are, are running away from your computers. Come back. It's 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 not that complicated, but you, you got to understand the basics. So the definition, the amount of positive head and feet of liquid, absolute, required at the pump suction to prevent vaporization or cavitation of the fluid. So in layman's terms, the, you know, the impeller is pulling the water into the eye. And, and if it pulls too hard, the pressure drops low enough so that the water flashes to steam. And um, for you, for even more layman's terms, and, and trust me, I was there. I'm a, I deal with electrons, not really water molecules. But for, for me, the way it finally snapped was think of a piece of string. And let's say you need to pull a weight across your desk. If you, if you just yank it as fast as you can, you're going to snap the string. But if you pull slowly, you'll, you know, everything will be fine. So um, kind of like that's why 3,600 RPM pumps have a higher NPSH requirement than 1800 RPMs and then slower spinning um, impellers. So back to the impeller, uh, when the water flashes to steam, the pressure, it flashes to steam and then it, uh, let's see, when the impeller starts to increase the pressure, well, the pressure rises high enough so that the steam bubble collapses back to a liquid and, you know, it, this is not a smooth transition. It's more like a tiny explosion or, or an implosion, I guess. And it's violent enough to chip to actually chip away at the impeller so that over time, the impeller's worn down and you actually start to lose performance. And uh, I didn't believe it at first, but but then somebody plopped one of these impellers in my hands and I said, okay, I, 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 I get it now. And, and usually when it's cavitating, you can, you can pretty much hear it, but the equation your net positive suction head available, um, you'll, you'll see that that's a system thing. How much NPSH do you have available? And now on the pump curves, it says NPSH R, which is for required. So your, your available is your absolute pressure. Um, this is what atmospheric pressure at whatever elevation you're at. 
and then you subtract the vapor pressure of the water. So ambient temperature water has a low, um, a low vapor pressure, but when you're doing boiler feed at 200 plus degrees, the vapor pressure pretty much cancels out with the atmospheric pressure. And then you just, you, you know, if you have any static head above the inlet of the pump, you can add that, but then you subtract the friction. Uh, and so on the little diagrams, on the left side, we've got a flooded suction where there's a tank feeding the pump. <clears throat> so you got the atmospheric pressure pushing on the liquid. Um, you're probably gonna be fine, especially if it's, uh, you know, ambient temperature water. But on the suction lift, that's where the pump is pulling from a spot lower than the inlet. That's where you need to, you know, cross your T's and, and dot your I's. Um, I don't know if there's anything to add to this. I think. Well, the the important part about NPSH with boosters is that if you've got pressurized water coming from the city, 30, 40, 50, 60 psi, and it's 60 degrees, you don't have to go through all this. Um, this is especially important for when you have a flooded suction coming from a brake tank or you're pulling from below the pump suction. Um, anytime when you're looking at a suction gauge, it's almost pegged at zero or below zero in a vacuum. That's when you really, really need to go over NPSH. Pressurized yeah. water from the city, don't worry about it. Yeah. Um, and, and also on, uh, on the Grunfoss, if somebody said they were doing a suction lift, uh, suction lift um, job, we would actually put check valves on the inlet side and then have a small, a very small manifold bypass. And so, you know, when, when there's no flow, the high pressure bleeds back to the suction side and that helps seat the foot valve. That would be down here, you know, that way you, you maintain your, uh, what would you call it? Your prime, uh, you maintain your prime. So just some ideas. Okay, <clears throat> last couple slides here. Common mistakes, things to keep in mind. Um, so the bulk of the, uh, the oh no moments that I've seen have certainly been the easy stuff. Uh, check your voltage and then double check your voltage. Um, but yeah, there, there's no easy button. If you're gonna do it, do it right. And so with, with retrofitting, you know, the biggest mistake, I think Reese already talked about that, is, is sometimes you don't wanna just look at the existing pumps tags. You, you wanna look at um, the actual demands for the pumps. And um, let's see. Okay, and, and I sized up plenty of boosters in my life. And I always compare, you know, for the most part, everybody needs redundancy. So I always compare two 100% pumps and then three 50% pumps. And if it's a big enough system, I'll look at four 33% pumps and, and even so on. But I just found that, and I don't know the, the GPM range, but I'd say if it's over 100 to 150 GPM, when in doubt, I would go with three 50% pumps. And again, that's where that, Remember the green and the red shaded areas? That that's that's kind of the reason for that. Um, let's see. Don't forget dry run protection. Um, either pressure switch or ultrasonic liquid level switch. Some people use that as well. Uh, let's see. And, and maybe a a final thing is this: bigger is not always better. If you size pumps that have too much pressure, you're actually going to lose performance if the boost is below the knee of the curve. And, and by the knee of the curve, I'm talking about this point right here. So if the pumps are too much pressure, you know, if, you, if you're wanting to use 400 GPM, but the pumps are only boosting 100, or you thought they would be boosted 170, you, you're going to be out past the shaded area and possibly cavitating and in overload conditions. Um, and then if you size pumps that are just too big from a flow perspective, you'll lose turn down capabilities and you just, you get a drop in overall system efficiencies. Uh, Reese, I think you have one, a note for high dollar lofts and apartments. Yeah, just uh, um, tenant knowledge. So if you're designing for middle class, it's one thing, but if you're designing for like downtown lofts and apartments, understand that those are usually, um, 
not family oriented, so one to two people per unit. A lot of them are wealthy, it might be expensive lofts, so they're rarely there, they're traveling a lot. So you're gonna have a, a, a tremendous amount of low flow going on when you have that type of uh, type of building and apartments in like, for example, downtown areas. So understand how many occupants per unit is actually gonna be there. Yeah. Um, again, that was the slide from above, I just threw it in there for reference. So I think that's it. We're a little over time, but um, does anybody have any questions? We've got a, a happy Kramer now. At least he thinks he's happy. Yeah, I think that we've been answering some of the questions, uh, typing them in as we go along, but certainly if we didn't get to your question or answer, we'll, you know, offline, we'll make sure everybody gets a response for any question that you either pre-submitted or that you typed in that we might. <clears throat> I got to turn over to the pros to answer. So we did as much as we can as we were going.